So if you're a physical therapist, physical therapy student, personal trainer, really anyone in the movement profession, chances are you have took some sort of biomechanics class at one point or another during your career. Now, the question I have for you is how many of you have utilized biomechanics to choose the correct exercise? In my opinion, I feel like a lot of us do not use what we learn in a biomechanics course, and that's totally fine. The problem, in my opinion, is that we learn from a textbook, but the real world doesn't happen in textbook fashion. And so it's really hard to correlate this textbook to a real world setting. So what I want to do in this video is show you a more simplified approach to biomechanics, one that really helps you understand a patient's pattern in anatomy and biomechanics. But then how do we start to use that information so we can get them out of pain, so we can help them perform better, so we can help them move better, right? When you start to understand these concepts, those things become a reality because at that point, we're not guessing. We're not giving someone random exercise. We're actually utilizing the specificity of their anatomy to help us intentionally prescribe exercise. So in this video, I'm primarily going to focus on the pelvis and the lower extremity. However, if you're interested in this type of content, let me know in the comments below and I would be happy to make an upper extremity video. Now, when it comes to understanding the biomechanics of the pelvis, I do think it's useful to understand the traditional textbook language and then how we're gonna start to twist that to our own language and in a way that's a little bit more simplified to then bring it into exercise decision. So when it comes to the pelvis, every patient that we see is going to be biased towards one pattern or another. The first pattern is one that's more in a posterior pelvic tilt, and the second pattern is more in an anterior pelvic tilt. So when we have a posterior pelvic tilt, the anominate bones go into external rotation, abduction and flexion, as the sacrum goes into counter nutation, okay? When it comes to our anterior pelvic tilt, the sacrum goes into nutation and tips forward. The innominate bones go into internal rotation, adduction, and extension. Notice how they're just the opposite of one another. So that's great to know, right? But in the real world, a lot of us just memorize anatomy and movements, but don't link it to actual movement in the real world. So what I want you to do is, yes, remember those associated movements. And if you already forgot, go back, rewind, write it down. Now we want to start to understand how do those movements influence compression and expansion? And to me, understanding the biomechanics of the pelvis from a compression or expansion standpoint is a much easier way to understand what exercise we need to choose for our patients. Now, I do want to give credit where credit is due, and a lot of this compression and expansion wouldn't be possible as far as the understanding of it without the work of Bill Hartman. He is a physical therapist. He has a channel. Go check him out. He's really shed light to this compression and expansion model. So with that said, once we understand the associated movements that come with the posterior pelvic tilt and anterior pelvic tilt, we now want to understand compression and expansion. So for the posterior pelvic tilt, in order to get that pattern, muscles need to compress in certain places and muscles need to expand. So because this is getting compressed, we have compression back here. And because we have compression posteriorly, we have expansion anteriorly, right? Because the body, for the most part, will work in opposition. So when we have compression somewhere, usually the opposite is going to be expanded. So instead of memorizing and understanding counter nutation, external rotation, flexion, abduction, what we're doing is simplifying it down to two categories. The back is getting compressed, the front's being expanded. And the good news is, if you know one, you know the other. Because when someone's in more of an anterior pelvic tilt, we have nutation of the sacrum. Notice how this pushes back. Well, the only way that this will be able to push back is if the muscles allow it. And when muscles can expand, they can allow it. So for an anterior pelvic tilt, we have just the opposite. We have more expansion back here and more compression anteriorly. And the more you work with the human body, the more you'll start to recognize these patterns when you're on the PT table for your assessments. Those in one pattern usually pinch where they don't 
have space to do so, aka they're too compressed. And so for our anterior pelvic tilts, they usually compress going through hip flexion because they're so compressed here, but they're more expanded here. So to me, that's a much easier way to understand the biomechanics. Now, how do we relate that to exercise? Now, when it comes to exercise, ultimately your execution needs to align with your intent. This means that if your intent is performance-based, then we need to execute that way. If your intent is weight loss, we need to execute that way. If your intent is to get out of pain, we need to execute that way. And the way that you coach movement and the exercises you choose are probably going to be different based on those goals. Now for this video, I want to talk about getting someone out of pain. How do we do that? Well, when a patient comes in, they're in a certain pattern and they are going to start to be so limited in that pattern that they don't have any variable movement. So a very simplified approach from a physical therapy standpoint is we need to increase or improve our patient's movement variability. Now, a lot of us are familiar with that, but this is where the biomechanics come in. Let's walk through the two patterns and learn how to improve their movement variability. So if a patient comes in, and they are in an anterior pelvic tilt, they are going to have nutation, internal rotation, adduction, extension. And what we talked about is that also relates to expansion and compression, right? Now, ultimately, the assessment that you do, the movements that you watch are going to confirm or deny that. But there is usually going to be an overwhelming bias from an expansion to compression standpoint. So what do we do? Well, hopefully you're starting to see it's, it's actually pretty easy. All we need to do is get them good at what they're bad at. And this is why prescribing random exercise doesn't work. Because if you prescribe random exercise, it may stick half the time. But if you're dealing with the opposite pattern, you're actually getting them stronger in their dysfunctional pattern. So what does this mean? For our anterior pelvic tilt, all we need to do is get them compression here. What does that compression do? It gives them space here. What does this really do? It starts to change the pattern. Notice how I'm not talking about flexion, counter nutation, nutation. I'm not talking in that anatomical way. I'm just looking at where is this person biased towards compression? Where are they biased towards expansion? And I just wanna get them better at the opposite. When we do this, we can improve movement variability. So this means exercises that compress posteriorly are going to be preferred for this type of pattern. How do we do that? Hamstrings are a big time exercise. 90-90 exercises where you can really get the hamstrings on. Any sort of vertical motion, squatting, specifically with a front load, so that way you can capture that compression is going to be great. And so as you start to go through this, you start to recognize that you don't need me to do exercises for you because I don't know how your patient presents like. What I can tell you are the principles of the biomechanics and then you can apply certain principles in specific ways to your patients to get them better, all by just referencing compression and expansion. And so hamstrings, squatting, vertical type exercises are a really good one to start to compress back here and to start to expand here. Now, hopefully based off me saying that you already know what I'm going to say for the opposite pattern. The opposite pattern was our posterior pelvic tilt. We said there's compression here and expansion here. So what do we want to do? We want to expand here and we want to compress here. How do we do that? Hinging biased exercises are going to do that. Why? Because we move more vertical. That verticality in movement expands posteriorly and compresses anteriorly. So you see, just by thinking compression and expansion, we start to understand the pattern of the patient when they walk in. We then use our assessment to confirm that pattern, and we understand how they are in that pattern from a biomechanical standpoint. And no, we're not getting caught up in the anatomy. All we're looking at is where is this person compressed and where are they expanded. From there, it guides us to very specific exercises that we need to do for that patient to get out of pain. And like I said, the specifics of the exercises are your job based off how your patient presents. Applying the principles is what I'm trying to help you do. And so I hope you found that useful. If you have questions on that, leave them in the comments below and I'd be glad to answer. And I can't wait to see you guys on the next video.